Okay, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you uh, for coming tonight to the last JSC seminar before um, reading week. My name is Fabi Gigi. I'm the chair of the Japan Research Center here at SOAS, and it is my pleasure to introduce the speaker um, for tonight. So Eleanor Methurst is a fashion historian uh, with an undergraduate degree in fashion and dress history and a master in history of design and material code culture, both from the University of Brighton. She specializes in lesbian fashion history and runs a blog called Dressing Dykes, which, for which she has written over 30 articles, ranging from two white dresses, the fashion of lesbian weddings, to the lesbian history of short hair. She has built a substantial social media presence um, over the year, and she's also the author of her first book called Unsuited, A History of Lesbian Fashion, which was published by Hearst uh, in 2004. I've ordered a copy for the library, which sadly hasn't uh, arrived yet, but I understand there is one slide um, yeah. at the very back. Um, one of our articles has been recent. If you're a fan of Gillian Anderson, which I am, um, <laughs> you may have uh, heard it on the post podcast. One of the articles was featured on Gillian Anderson's uh, podcast. Um, so if you're interested about that, please have a look online as well. And I'll give a please a big welcome to our speaker for tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. And thank you for bearing with us with the technical stuff. I'm glad to be here and we're ready to go. So yes, I'm Eleanor Medhurst. Uh, I'm a historian of primarily lesbian fashion. And I focus my research on lesbian fashion history because I have this educational background in fashion history and noticed a lack of research about clothes that were worn by lesbians or people who we might consider to be lesbian adjacent or lesbian like. Clothing and self-presentation is a really interesting lens through which we can analyze and learn about social histories and especially the histories of marginalized communities seeking to represent themselves or sometimes to hide aspects of their identities. We all make decisions about the clothes that we wear and this is nothing new. Often it says a lot about our place in the world. So the talk that I'm presenting today, Fashioning Lesbianism, Sato and the Global New Woman, is a meeting of some of the research that I've done about lesbians or people who we might consider to be lesbians in the early 20th century. And this appear, most of this research appears as a chapter in my book, Unsuitable. In this talk, I'll mostly be focusing on Sato, a Japanese publication that we might call feminist that ran from 1911 to 1916 as well as a few of its members and the way that they presented themselves through their clothes. However, I'll also be comparing this to the global concept of the new woman, appearing in various contexts across the world during this period, including in New York and in the US and particularly in the neighborhood of Harlem, um, as well as the women's suffrage movement in the UK and a community nicknamed Paris Lesbos in Paris in France. The lens through which I'm talking about these movements and communities and considering them in relation to Sato in Japan is through clothing, fashion and self-presentation. And the way that these things can be an expression of politics as well as personal ideals. So the first issue of Sato was published in 1911. It was named by its founders in reference to the Blue Stocking Society, which was around in 18th century England. It was a literary women's group that, again, we might now call proto-feminist. Sato was run by women for women, promoting equal rights for women through literature. It ran for five years, pushing against backlash from the press and the Japanese government the whole time. It was created by a group of five women and contributed to by over a hundred, including Hiratsuka Raicho and Otake Kokichi and Yoshia no Nobuko, who I'll come back to later on. The context of early 20th century Japan, even just in central Tokyo, is rarely considered within wider lesbian history, which is so often thought to begin in sort of the roaring 1920s and within extensively studied lesbian societies in Europe and North America. 
However, while the clothing culture of 1910s Japan, and more specifically Tokyo, is distinct, there are similarities between it and other contexts more frequently included in lesbian history. Seito emerged into a changing Japan. This was, of course, right at the end of the Meiji era, with the country being in a midst of transition from more inward to more outward looking. It had been half a century since Japan had opened its doors to trade with the world. And ideas and fashions, as well as some prejudices from Europe and the US, were kind of creeping in. The Japanese public at this time, while embracing change with one hand, were holding tight onto their own culture with another. And the responsibility of this culture conservation often landed on the shoulders of women. While Japanese men were encouraged often to wear the shirts and trousers of Western clothes, Western fashion, women were expected to dress a lot of the time in traditional Japanese garments, as what the cultural historian Cynthia Green calls a reassuring visual image. The kimono was particularly encouraged for women, even though it had only taken the form of kimono in kind of recent years at that time. Um, and women, while wearing garments like the kimono, had a responsibility to preserve Japan's legacy and just display the culture of Japan on their bodies. At the turn of the 20th century, just as Japanese girls had begun to enter schools and colleges en masse for the first time, a new doctrine was emerging to keep them on the path to womanhood that upheld traditional and patriarchal values, which was the concept of the good wife, wise mother. But of course, some women didn't want to be told what to do or what they should wear. The same was true everywhere across the globe. New women were springing into action in many different contexts. The phrase new woman refers to women at the turn of the 20th century from around 1890 to 1920 or so, who were daring to live in ways that it hadn't previously been socially acceptable for them to do. In many instances, these actions were still not socially acceptable, but they persevered in them. It makes sense that this was a worldwide phenomenon, even though the cultures that new women were appearing in were sometimes vastly different. At the turn of the 20th century, with the development of new communicative technologies, such as telegrams and an ever-growing rail network expanding across the world, people and ideas were more globally interconnected than ever. Repeatedly, women were standing up for themselves, their rights and their passions and the things they believed in. In Britain, the new woman can perhaps be defined by the suffragette movement. This was the nickname given by the British press to women's suffrage campaigners who were fighting for women's right to vote. The nickname was defiantly claimed and the movement defined by the colors white, green and purple was recognizable across the country. There were also many prominent lesbians or possible lesbians among the ranks of famous and influential suffragettes, even if they're rarely recognized as such. These include the uh, suffragette chauffeur Vera Jack Holm and the composer Ethel Smythe, alongside many others. It's even possible, while we're on this note, that two of the most famous suffragettes, Annie Kenny and Christabel Pankhurst, were in a romantic relationship. Then across the pond, American new women took many forms, but one of the queerest was the lady lovers during the Harlem Renaissance. In New York City's neighborhood of Harlem in the early 20th century, all the way into the 1940s and beyond, black women were breaking all the social rules. In a country fueled by racism, carving out an independent life as a black woman was difficult but black women who loved women calling themselves terms like lady lovers, studs, BD women for bull dagger women dominated New York City stages as blues singers and as male impersonators and went to gatherings known as rent parties where they could be surrounded by other people like them. Often attendees would come to these parties with a change of clothes in a suitcase, changing from the skirts and dresses suitable in the world to trousers or men's suits once they got inside the safe space of the party. New women everywhere, no matter if admired or respected by some, were demonized by others. 
in mediums like newspaper, political cartoons, fashion could be a tool to condemn new women because fashion helped to pinpoint new women as different from old women. Fashion was a tool that could be twisted in illustrations to mock and dissuade other women from taking the same path. Yet fashion was, have I skipped a, no, I haven't. I just had a moment where I thought I'd skip a slide. A slide. Um, sorry, fashion was how new women created this visual image. In a similar way, but with almost a different motive to the women in Japan who were being encouraged to wear kimonos to preserve Japanese culture. Despite this, the sartorial politics of 1910s Japan was far from usual. It wasn't attempting only to preserve appropriate femininity, but a whole history and culture. The language of garments was also, of course, culturally specific, and their history and cultural associations made them viable choices for Japanese new women, including uh, Hiratsuka Raicho and Atake Kokichi, uh, members of Sato. These include the yukata, which didn't carry as much of the gendered responsibility of the kimono in early 20th century Japan. There's also hakama, which exists in two different forms. So the andon hakama and the umanon hakama. So one is split and one is more um, skirt-like. The split umanon hakama were typically during this period worn by men and which they were the style which were worn by samurai. Hakama of any kind are more practical garments than, for instance, a kimono, and as such, they were introduced as school uniforms in the Meiji era, coinciding with the openings of the first girls' schools in Japan. Hakama right away were criticized as uniforms for girls since they had the association with samurai and were considered inappropriate for both in terms of class and gender boundaries, which was a concern that led to girls wearing more skirt-like hakama in school settings. This lecture is, however, about the fashioning of lesbian identity. So how does lesbian fashion fit into this landscape of hakama, Japanese schoolgirls, and the good wife, wise mother ideology? So let's focus our attention back to Sato's members. Though Hiratsuka Raicho was one of the founding members of Sato and Otake Kokichi only a contributor, together these two women were central targets for attacks on the publication by the Japanese media and by wider society. This is because, in the words of academic Wu Peichen in her 2002 article, Performing Gender Along the Lesbian Continuum, um, they transgressed what was supposed to be male territory. In an in-depth study by of Kokichi by the religious studies scholar Alexandra Loop, she then suggests that the young, outspoken, masculine Otake Kokichi appeared at the time to be a perfect bogeyman for social conservatives to demonize and make the face of dangerous, pathological, modern femininity that was coming out of women's colleges. This dangerous, pathological, modern femininity was one imagined to be steeped in a new cultural fear, those AI. Dose AI was a new term in the early 20th century for homosexuality in Japan, and one that could be used to describe love between women. That it could be used for female same-sex love meant that it wasn't only a new term, but a new conception, at least in public and in language. Before around the 1910s, the predominant term for same-sex love in Japan was danshoku, which was mostly applied to love between men. Lesbianism was a creeping threat. Sato's publication coincided with a shift in conceptions of love between women and the dawning of what's often considered the beginning of a modern lesbian history. Japan wasn't exempt from this, and yet the political, and the personal relationships between women and their lesbian significance in this period have seldom been put on a pedestal and studied in depth. The lesbian-like concept of dos AI was new only because it hadn't been expressed before rather than it hadn't been felt. Women who love women have always existed throughout the world, 
But 1910's Japan marks the opening of a lesbian floodgate of writing and style. This was partially born out of imported European concepts of sexology and the works of some of its leading scholars who I'll return to in a moment, but also from this new sphere of Japanese women's schools and colleges and the close female friendships that were possible within them. The potential for deep, even romantic relationships between girls in school environments in the early 20th century has left its mark on Japan and on Japanese lesbian pop culture. In fact, it's an entire literary genre named Class S. Class S refers to stories and relationship dynamics based in Japanese girls' schools, typically with an older girl, younger girl dynamic. The S can stand for a range of meanings, but the most common is sister, not all of Class S stories and relationships are romantic, but many of them are. Many more can be read as such by those who are looking for the right things. The birth of Class S is usually attributed to Yoshio Nobuko and her 1919 novel, Yanayura no Nishojo. Sorry, stumbling over my words there. This is Nobuko and then Nobuko with her life partner, Monma Chio. In the story, the main character, the shy and awkward Akiko, begins studying at a Catholic girls' school where she shares a room with a free-spirited character named Akitsu. By the end of the novel, Akitsu has brought Akiko out of her shell, so much so that when Akitsu asks Akiko to leave the school and start a life together, Akiko agrees with no hesitation. The narrative that Nobuko spins in Yanayura no, no Nishojo is very much a feminist statement. The decision that's made by the main character continuing to live outside of this girl's school setting, still committed to another girl rather than evolving into a good wife and wise mother was the opposite of what was expected of girls and young women. It's of course an important event in the history of Japanese lesbian literature. Erica Friedman in her extensive studies of Yuri anime and manga, which she defines as any story with lesbian themes in Japanese animation and comics, even honors Nobuko as the grandmother of Yuri and dedicates her book on the topic to the late writer. The girls' school setting of this class S genre, the precursor to modern Japanese lesbian media, is not only tied to lesbian culture and its fashioning, but also to Sato, since Yoshio Nobuko was one of the early writers for the magazine. It's hardly as if the conventions of class S appeared out of thin air. The relationships uh, that were going on in girls' schools were a hot topic in Japanese press in the Japanese media, and consequently were public knowledge. A newspaper article from 1911 even selected, even listed a selection of words that schoolgirls used to refer to passionate love between one another, supposedly trying to expose this as a phenomenon. The words which these are taken from Leila J. Rupp's sophistries included Goshin Yu, intimate friends, Ohaikara, stylish from the English term high collar, Onetsu, fever or passion, ome, possibly a combination of the words male and female, and odea, an honorific attached to the Japanese version of the English word dear. So that's the list from Sapphistries there. As a fashion historian, what jumps out to me in that is the, the term ohaikara. It's particularly interesting to me in how it relates to lesbian communities or passions between girls and women. In this context, Ohaikara is defining passionate love between girls by clothing and specifically by a very masculine aspect of clothing during this period, which is the high collar. In Western fashion in Europe and North America, at the turn of the 20th century, high collars on dresses and blouses were fashionable. An archetypical image of an Edwardian lady, for an example, will include a high collared white blouse or long sleeves and lace. In men's fashion, however, or perhaps I should say masculine fashion, since it's not as if no women dress this way, the high collar in question would be a wingtip shirt collar high on the neck. But in the years that followed going into the 20s, high collars became synonymous with lesbian fashion. 
For example, in Paris of the early 20th century, there was a thriving lesbian community, so much so that it gains the nickname Paris Lesbos. A central meeting place within Paris Lesbos was a women-focused literary salon hosted by the heiress Natalie Clifford Barney from 1909 and then for 60 years afterwards. In historian Diana Sahami's biography of four of Paris Lesbos's central figures called No Modernism Without Lesbians, she writes about the dress code of these literary salons. High collars and monocles were clues of being a lesbian. So was brilliantine short hair, a white carnation or sprig of violets pinned to a jacket lapel, a ring on a pinky finger. Beyond such badges of allegiance, an appraising glance of recognition was universally understood. So we can see an example of this look in this portrait of famous lesbian Una Trowbridge, who was an attendee of Natalie's salons. Interestingly, Una was one of many people who we would now call lesbians who actually preferred the term inverts. Sexual inversion was a way of classifying and describing homosexuality in the early 20th century. For female inverts, there were two separate labels, the congenital inverts and the pseudo invert, sometimes known as the active and the passive partner. These were terms coined by the sexologist Havelock Ellis, but not uninspired by some earlier work of another sexologist, Richard von Kraft Ebbing. Kraft Ebbing's work, Psychopathia Sexualis, was published in Germany in 1886, and Havelock Ellis published Sexual Inversion, his book, in 1897. It was Ellis's writing that pioneered the study of homosexuality or inversion and began to make it visible as a concept in an area of scientific research rather than as it being some kind of personal sin or failing. All kinds of homosexuality continued to be condemned and or persecuted across the world after the publication of sexologist research, of course. However, the study of sexology, combined with the growing visibility of nonconformist women during this period, made love between women begin to be a possibility for some people who had never considered it before. In many cases, this meant that it was named either with labels like inversion or, as in Japan, with specific terms like gosei. It also meant that it could be criticised in the press. If lesbianism or something like it was suddenly visible and suddenly had a name, it was able to be more clearly condemned. In Japan, the public fear and disgust for dozei reached a fever pitch by the end of the Meiji era in the early 2010s, not 2010s, 1910s. Hiratsuka Raicho and Atake Kokichi, some of Saito's most visible members, were easy targets. Both women were feminist writers, they were lifelong political activists. Raicho was born in Tokyo in 1886, she was a prominent figure in the Japanese peace movement and worked towards shaping the Japan of her dreams through writing and lecturing until the end of her life in 1971. Kokichi was born in 1893 in Osaka, making her seven years younger than Raicho. Kokichi's life and achievements aren't widely recognized, though her life and work in many ways were revolutionary. She was a Marxist, as well as a feminist and a lesbian, and she taught her daughters to value equality and independence as well. Their relationship that was very well known was short-lived from only 1911 to 1912, starting when Kokichi was 18 and Raicho was 25. Though the two women's lives were only briefly intertwined, it was an entanglement with long-lasting effects on both of their legacies. The year-long relationship was immortalized in the stories that Kokichi wrote for Sato about her passionate feelings for Raicho, as well as Raicho's retrospective essay, Ichinen Kan, meaning one year. Their actions, their feminist ideals, and their clothing all pinpointed them as being different. Most damningly, they had taken their ideals onto the streets, in 1912, Raicho, Kokichi, and another Sato member visited Yoshiwara, Tokyo's red light district at the time, something very much not done by respectable women. 
In Yoshiwara, they hired a geisha for the evening in order to talk about the needs of geisha within the women's movement. Uh, Alexandra Loop, who I cited earlier, defines this as an act of cross-class solidarity. It was politically motivated, but these were political motivations that the press could and would not condone. The trip was transformed into being something else, an indulgence, um, a deviance, a transgression. Shortly afterwards, articles and cartoons were published in numerous Japanese newspapers that condemned and satirized the Sato women, but particularly Raicho and Kokichi. Both women were targets because their actions were unambiguous. Their love for women, their political motivations, and their disdain for the idea of the good wife, wise mother. Alongside their written words, their unambiguity was also evident in the clothes that they wore. Sato created an, an environment where non-conformity in many different ways could blossom, which was, of course, a large reason for its vilification in the press. Raicho and Kokichi were certainly central targets, but other Sato members made up a wider culture of unambiguous, fem unambiguous feminist and lesbian ideals. For example, Yoshia Nobuko, the grandmother of Yuri, was quite obvious about her lifestyle, at least to those who knew what to look for. In Sarah Frederick's 2006 book, Turning Pages, Reading and Writing Women's Magazines in Interwar Japan, she explains how, I quote, Yoshia's own unfeminine appearance, she often wore androgynous clothing in magazine photo sessions, and the fact that she lived and traveled with another woman were fairly well known. Nobuko wrote about love between girls and women, though as her career blossomed and she began living with her life partner, Mon Machio, the queer themes that were evident in her early work became less explicit. Though female relationships were often still the focus, these were normally passionate friendships within narrative frameworks of heterosexual marriage. The reasons for this to me are obvious. To sustain a successful career, her personal lesbian life couldn't be too apparent. And she definitely had a successful career, despite and even because of her female-focused work. By the end of the 1930s, she was one of the wealthiest people in Japan. But it was Sato that encouraged Nobuko in this direction. Some academics have argued that it was Sato's influence that led Nobuko to not only begin writing female-focused stories, she was one of the early contributors to the magazine after all, but also to dress in an androgynous way. Sato certainly encouraged nonconformity, but it's important to note that Nobuko's androgynous style was a Western style of androgyny, similar to masculine-leaning styles worn by new women in Europe and America within the first decades of the 20th century. A lot of Nobuko's visual nonconformity came from this adoption of modern Western women's style, Photos of her from the 1920s and 30s show her sporting the kind of short bob that was popular for fashionable women in Europe and North America at this time. In this way, Nobuko's self-styling was a very different kind of fashioning lesbianism than the kind visible in the outfits of some of the other members of Sato, namely Hiratsuka Raicho and Atake Kokichi. So... By the later decades of her life, Raicho was a prominent figure in the Japanese peace movement, as I mentioned earlier, but in the early 19th century, she was the public face of Japanese feminism. This wasn't an easy position to occupy, and she was publicly labeled as being bisexual and also a sex addict, both claims that sought to defame her and the work of Sato. When words weren't enough, her reputation was characterized in illustrations like this, which depicts the Sato members meeting with the geisha in 1912, and Raicho is wearing uh, a hakama. This is combined in the illustration with spectacles and an open book in her hand, which Jan Bardsley, the author of The Blue Stockings of Japan, suggests symbolize the new women's intellectualism and love of literature. While this may be true, I think, in my opinion, it's more likely that in this particular cartoon, they're meant to refer to Raicho's masculinity. 
masculinity here isn't so much the purely the possession of masculine traits, but the dismissal of those considered properly feminine. It's also important to consider the inclusion of the Hakama. It's accurate to write to self-presentation since she did customarily wear them. I found no confirmation as to kind of the styles that she wore, but it's possible that her preferred style was the divided version since she's consistently referred to as a cross-dresser and the divided Hakama was ordinarily or traditionally worn by men. This contests a point made by Bardsley, where she insists upon Hakama being feminine, saying that despite being seen as masculine, Hakama had become the uniform of the time for girl students. However, even if Raicho did customarily wear a skirted Hakama, the association with girl students is as much a disidentification with traditional Japanese adult femininity as a divided Hakama would be. Raicho all but confirms this in her own autobiography. In the beginning, women, woman was the sun, writing about her clothing in the years after she graduated from college. She wrote, despite my mother's objections, I still wore a hakama, though I was no longer a student. I found an obi too constricting, and besides, a hakama was better for zazen, sitting meditation. I kept my hairstyle simple, parting my hair to one side or down the middle, twisting it into a bun in the back and fastening it with two imitation tortoiseshell combs. Shortly after this statement, she wrote, I sometimes wonder whether my parents were disappointed to have a daughter who never consulted them or asked their opinion, who never showed interest in what she ate or took pleasure in receiving a new kimono. The expectation for Japanese women of this period to wear a kimono was one part of the wider expectation that they fulfill the role of the good wife-wise mother. And Raicho's choice to wear a hakama of any kind could be read as a conscious denial of the role of wife and mother, focusing her energies instead on women-led communities and relationships with women, as in the girl-centric environments of schools and colleges. This choice was notable even to her contemporaries in Sato, such as Tamura Toshiko, who hovered for a time around the possibility of a relationship with Raicho. In Toshiko's story, Nikki, or Diary, she describes Raicho's dress and appearance, focusing on her tendency to wear hakama and wooden clogs. Toshi Toshiko's inclusion of these details was a deliberate decision to emphasize Raicho's masculine qualities within the narrative that she was creating. I think of Raicho's hakama wearing as fashioning lesbianism and as part of a tradition of women loving women dressing to remove themselves from heteropatriarchal norms. I can't explicitly label Raicho as a lesbian because she had a long-term passionate relationship with a man and was even described in an article in 1912 as being bisexual. And later in her life, she consciously shunned any association with queer identities or lifestyles, crafting her image into one that could be respected and have a legacy in late 20th century Japan. Despite this, I see the way that she dressed as a fashioning of lesbianism and there are enough links between her life and lesbian history, culture and community that it's impossible to fully separate them. Wu Peichen uh, discussed this in 2002, writing that, though keenly aware of the risk of using the term lesbian in my argument, I maintain that there is continuity as well as difference between the notion of those AI attached to the Sato members and our contemporary notion of lesbianism. Like so many other stories, Raicho's fits into almost a daisy chain of lesbian fashion history, though it also blooms independently. Lesbian history continuously overlaps with bisexual histories, with transgender histories, and the overlap doesn't remove their specific significance. The strongest link is, of course, Raicho's infamous relationship with Atake Kokichi. And this relationship with both women involved, presenting and acting in a masculine way, is sometimes even described with the term danshoku, or male colour, essentially that the pair were more like male lovers than like lesbians. Though in later years, Raicho described their one-year relationship as one-sided on Kokichi's side, 
her May 1912 essay, Marumado Yori from the Round w Window, affirms that there was mutuality in their love. Published in Sato, the essay tells us how passionate my kisses and hugs were to make Kokichi become part of my world. Later in the essay, she continues this theme, writing, I put all of Kokichi's letters and postcards into boxes in order. I cannot even put myself together. There are 29 letters and 38 postcards that I have received since November 30th last year. The night of the 13th is unforgettable, the night they spent together for the first time. I selected the letters, including the express ones delivered after that night and read them again. By the end of 1912, this passionate love was over, at least for Raicho. But the year was a formative one for Kokichi. She'd formed a scandalous <laughs> reputation at Sato, and some of its most boundary-breaking writing and excursions can be attributed to her. It was Kokichi who, intending to write about sex workers' needs in the women's movement, had organized the visit to the geisha Aizen, which later became satirized in political cartoons like the one we saw earlier. Kokichi too wrote repeatedly about her love for women and particularly her love for, for Raicho. She once wrote that, whether I am enslaved or have to sacrifice, if only the embraces and kisses do not disappear, I will be happy. Another piece from after the end of their relationship is addressed specifically to Raicho in the title with Kokichi writing within it that, my woman's run away. Most badly received, however, was the five-coloured sake incident. This refers to a story that Kokichi wrote for Sato in which a half-fictional Raicho drinks a colourful lay layered cocktail with a young man who's thought to be an avatar for Kokichi. Public drinking in Japan was a heavily symbolic masculine pastime during this period, and Kokichi's story brought shame not only to the magazine, but to Raicho too. Kokichi's time with Sato was a whirlwind in every part of her life. After the geisha and the sake scandals, she was called to be expelled from the magazine, though she did continue to create uh, feminist translations as well as woodcut cover designs uh, for a time after she stopped writing. Shortly afterwards, she was diagnosed with tuberculosis and finally lost her relationship with Raicho, who began an affair with the man she would later marry, who was a friend of Kokichi's, while they were both visiting Kokichi on her sickbed. Not very nice behaviour. Despite her devastation at this, Kokichi's life didn't end at this point. Neither did her place in lesbian fashion history or her contribution to lesbian culture in Japan. Here she is. So Kokichi, unlike Raicho, has been referred to time and time again as a lesbian. Shortly after the end of their relationship, in an introduction to Raicho's translation of sexologist Havelock Ellis's Sexual Inversion in Women, Raicho even refers to Kokichi as a congenital sexual invert, like I touched on earlier. This pathologized Kokichi's sexuality while positioning Raicho as separate from it. Though she married a man, Tomimoto Kenkichi, and had two daughters, they later divorced on the grounds that Kokichi was a lesbian, with her husband explicitly using the English loanword res lesbian or lesubian in his argument. Their separation was also caused by ideological differences that had grown more and more opposed over the years, with Kokichi's politics being in line with Marxist feminism and her husband becoming a nationalist. Her politics was the product of seeds sown in her youth when she was a member of Sato and when she was in love with Raicho. Kokichi's first daughter, in fact, was named Akira in, um, with the kanji for son, thought to be a reference to the opening lines of the first ever issue of Sato, which was written by Raicho in the beginning, Woman Was the Sun. Kokichi fit a lot of life into the years between leaving Sato in 1912 and her death in 1966. In 1913, she published her essay, A Gathering of Geisha, in Chuo Koron magazine, uh, <laughs> completing the work that she'd set out to do when she'd organized that visit to, um, 
to the geisha Aizan that was characterized in the press. She raised two opinionated and independent daughters, often just on her own, while writing feminist fairy tales for a magazine named Funa. She began writing for another publication called Women's Art, and during the Second World War, she devoted her energy to creating women's spaces and being cre creating creative spaces once more, starting a salon based out of her own home where women could come together to work and exist. Those in regular attendance at this salon were some of the most notable queer female artists in mid-century Japan, including other ex-members of Sato, even Raicho, despite the messy breakup from many years before. Kokichi stayed true to herself throughout her life. I just can't be dishonest about myself, is how she phrased the notion in a letter from when she was a teen. From her introduction to feminist writing when she first discovered Sato in her girlhood, she knew that she wanted to live unconstrained. She wrote to the publication and wrote again and again until everyone there knew her name. Or they would have known her name if it had stayed the same, as she tested out loads in her quest to find her true self until she found Kokichi, which uh, is usually used as a male name. She knew that she wanted something different from her life, which very much included a love and deep admiration for women. In 1935, she wrote the following as a reflection on her first meeting with Raicho. I had wanted to meet her for so long that I dared not look at her face. She spoke in a shushed voice that seemed to enfold me. I summoned my courage and raised my head. She was sitting upright, her shoulders drawn back, her small hands so like ivory folded on her lap. She was breathtakingly beautiful, her features even and refined. So this is the woman herself, so this is the woman herself. I tensed up as though I were paying homage to a graven image. <laughs> Kokichi's deliberate construction of herself and what she wanted included the clothes that she wore. She once described how she dressed in her youth. I wore the male student's hat, straightened my mantle's collar, put on the dark blue tabby and man's wooden clogs and smoked while I walked with my sister. In this description, she was very clearly and purposefully wearing men's clothing. Her clothing wasn't just masculine in form, but in color with dark blue often being used for male garments. The effects of Kokichi's clothing was reproduced in her actions, her words for one. In the original quotation, she used boku, which is of course a first person pronoun often used by young men. Smoking too wasn't typical behavior for women. As well as the garments noted here, Kokichi was also fond of wearing men's yukata, dressing in them throughout her life despite backlash from her husband while they were married. Raicho, in her autobiography, conjures Kokichi's fashion self for the reader, from her own first impression to a more general image of the other woman. So she wrote, My first impression of Kokichi was of a boyish young girl with a nicely rounded face, she wore a serge hakama, a matching kimono, and a haori of dark blue kurame cotton, a man's outfit that became her tall but well-fleshed figure. She looked dashing in her man's kimono and hakama, and sometimes she wore a man's kimono with a narrow sash tied low on her waist and a pair of leather-soled woven sandals. Striding into the office, her arms swinging, she would say whatever was on her mind, burst into song, and laugh out loud in her big voice. The garments worn by Kokichi and to a lesser extent by Raicho are repeatedly described as being men's clothing. Kokichi wore a man's outfit or a man's kimono, according to Raicho, which continually evoke masculinity. Neither woman's clothing can be understood, however, until we remember that many men were not wearing these clothes. At least often they were encouraged not to. Remember that at this time, it was popular for Japanese men to dress in Western-inspired fashions, with many women being urged instead to wear kimono, kimonos. The clothes worn by Hiratsuka Raicho and Otake Kokichi is a bigger story than just gender transgression through fashion, but a stance on the power that Japanese women did and didn't have and what they could or couldn't claim. 
consistently throughout history, lesbians have dressed in a masculine way. This isn't to say that all lesbians have been masculine, but the ones whose fashions tend to have been recorded are the ones who stood out as being different from a typical woman. There are different circumstances for this phenomenon, depending on the context, but it's an enduring theme. The case in the case of lesbian style in Japan in the 1910s, it's distinct because the masculinity that people like Raicho and Kokichi were claiming was one that no longer belonged only to men. Perhaps this made them more of a threat. They were creating something new with the clothes on their bodies and men weren't part of it. Because of this, it's impossible to simply compare and contrast the lives and clothes worn by some of the women of Sato, Raicho and Kokichi among them, with other global new women, or other instances of fashioning lesbianism. But we can certainly consider some in relation to each other. So the most obvious comparison to me between the fashion choices made by Raicho and Kokichi and other lesbians in history it's a self-presentation of butch lesbians around the middle of the 20th century, particularly in places where butch and femme lesbian identities were common, such as in the US. Butch and femme, if you don't know, are complex identities, but essentially can be described as very masculine and very feminine lesbians, often in relationships with one another. What's interesting is that in many cases, butch lesbians were not or still are not wholly masculine, either in their actions or their appearance. Time and time again throughout history in various different contexts, it's been difficult or unsafe for masculine women, butch lesbians as one example, to fully express themselves through their clothes and appearance. As with the masculine lady lovers of the Harlem Renaissance, Sometimes garments like trousers or suits could only be put on in safe spaces, such as parties or lesbian bars. The rest of the time, many butch lesbians in the 1940s, 50s and 60s would wear tailored shirts and ties, flat shoes and blazers, but pair them with a tailored skirt rather than a pair of trousers. This was a more masculine and self-affirming option than the flared circle skirts that encompassed the fashionable woman's silhouette of the mid-century. As with the clothes worn by Raicho and Kokichi, in these instances, butch lesbians were masculine, but not dressing like men were. Because of the specific context of their lives and the political landscape around them, their interpretation of masculine self-fashioning was distinct a lesbian interpretation of clothing rather than an appropriation of men's fashion. This is what I mean by fashioning lesbianism in the context of Sato. Through a mixture of their cultural context, personal intentions and community spaces and recognition, the women of Sato dressed in a way that was at once new and instinctive and which is integral to me to a history of lesbian fashion. So thank you for listening, and I hope that you found this interesting. Uh, if you would like to find out more about lesbian fashion history, that's all of my places and my book, Unsuitable, that came out this year. Um, so I would love to hear any questions or comments or any discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for a fantastic talk. I'm sure you have uh, loads of questions. Let me uh, start us off by... Um, I, I this is it was really very fascinating uh, because I'm more familiar with with the the, the non shoku side um, of things, but it really the way it fits together is so fascinating. And there was there was one moment when you talked about class S, the idea that okay, this is there is a lot of um, public attention, which means it's quite exciting for mm -hmm. people to learn about this. But it's also it happens within a frame that is well established. So it's uh, relationships between uh, older and younger partners which is exactly the same yeah. in the nunchuk and i do you, do you get the sense that this at least this was one sort of parameter that that sort of felt safe right that it, at least there is some kind of hierarchy involved yeah absolutely and i think that that's that's the case in so many different um iterations of, of queer relationships in so many contexts where there's like a framework and it's as you said, it's a way to feel safe and to feel allowable. It's a way to 
in in so many interviews that with going back to the example of like butch and femme um butch and femme lesbians saying in like the 1950s and periods such as that saying it was a way to feel not like a heterosexual relationship but like I could be recognized in the same way I was following like we also had a dynamic right um and I think that that's kind of a similar thing in terms of um ages and having a a guide to follow almost it's like almost legitimizes the relationship that it's like well this has happened in stories this has clearly happened before like it's it's something that has a legacy and a and a history and a template yeah exactly ah that's really fascinating thank you yeah thank you yes opening up to the floor (laughs) who wants to go first yes please um, first, yeah, thanks for the presentation. It's it's really not um, part of history that I'm uh, very familiar with, so I find it uh, very interesting. Uh, and thank you for introducing some of the historical uh, you know, characters that was part of the presentation. Um, I, I know uh, you were kind of concentrating on a very specific part of Japanese history, but I wondered if maybe we could just really pull a little bit to like modern day. Do you see anything similar happening in uh, Japanese culture right now where perhaps um, lesbians in Japan are taking? certain fashion uh, decisions as part of their I, I, I'm just thinking I'm not sure. I, I can't think of any like specific examples, but I do feel like um, that's something that continually happens in so many contexts. Um, yeah, as I said, I can't think of any specific examples, but that's just, you know, a a gap in my own knowledge rather than that there aren't any. Um, Yeah, I think that a more contemporary kind of coding is similar to the styles that you would see in like lesbian feminists and just feminists in general, um, fashions in like late 20th century Europe of like jeans and t-shirts and things like that and I think that that in a Japanese context is kind of different from obviously people are wearing jeans and t-shirts but it's maybe different from like the most fashionable look for women so it it gives more of a framework in like lesbian spaces and queer spaces but again I don't have any like specific things so if anyone if anyone does obviously do feel free to shout out but it's something that I would be interested in looking into more for sure. Thank you. Go on then. Any others? Anybody? Happy. <laughs> uh, just specifically fashion related, yes. Uh, thank you for a very um, exciting talk. I uh, just wanted to know something about the terminology for Haikara. Yes. And um, if you could maybe go back. I can go back so. to that slide. Or oh, can I? Yeah, that and this one. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, I, um, I, it's probably my ignorance, but I always thought that it was Haikara. I remembered it as Haikara. It might well be. I've like, never seen it, like, with all. So yeah. I just wanted to know, uh, maybe it's a distinction between Haikara as mm. in, I don't know, implying more to yeah, lesbian. Yeah, yeah. More Haikara meaning... Modern. yeah definitely i um i don't know um to be honest but i think that there's definitely the possibility that there there are the variations there but it might just be that this you know that my sources are have got something lost along the way um yeah but there i i had sort of picked up on that along the way as well that there are variations there but i just thought oh it's a it's a slightly different version so maybe that's the case yeah yeah because may, maybe putting all make it, it like, gives it a different like, meaning like, yeah as well right it's all i get that means yeah it, i mean it's, it's yeah it seems to be a horri- horif- uh, horrific yeah. you could yeah, yeah. You say yeah. oh, hi para this but like you know yeah. this is your high color yeah you introduce yourself maybe <laughs> yes sorry this um you also have your hands, and there's several. Um, yes, let's start here, and then Barbara. Well, I was interested in what you said about um, when you were describing Bush, Leslie, and uh clothing, 
how it was taking male clothing and not um, Referring to the Rana and Chapman in it. Um, and I'm wondering if there's kind of other examples of that within, whether it's within lesbian fashion or just feminist fashion in general, or like cross culturally. Yeah. I mean, I see um, almost very similar styles to as I described in like butch femme fashions of the 1950s um, happening in context that are the actual garments are very similar but like decades before such as during the 1920s with styles like this one um <clears throat> where it will be a very like masculine attire and then it will be paired always with a tailored skirt rather than a pair of trousers so there's always that last line of of difference between the the fully masculine like male look and then the masculine lesbian look um which is really interesting to me that there are these like these differences between those styles and that they appear time and time again in in examples like this and examples like butch and femme fashions and even earlier looking at people like Anne Lister who's a famous lesbian, the inspiration for the TV show, Gentleman Jack, who also wore like very masculine clothing, but it was recognizable as, as feminine. And yeah, it's kind of a continuation that's carried on. I can't off the top of my head think of examples that kind of fit that brief in different cultural contexts, but I'm sure that there are some as well. And it's something that I would be interested in looking at in the future as well. There's just so many there's so much possibility in terms of um, researching like intentions behind lesbian fashions and it's not something that's covered a lot of the time so it's interesting to look at the links that come up time and time again but yeah thank you that's a it's a really interesting point thank you. Sorry, now I'm you again, if I cannot get anything what's been said but I just thought um the term that we're on the table, this like this referred not to um styles but to character, right? Um as far as I'm aware, it's kind of like it's yeah. I'm not sure if the the context is specifically these are the the types of people or the relationship dynamics and I you know I think some things are different to others, but I just found the list really fascinating as like a selection. Yeah, I mean, you can read the book, of course, but I mean, it wouldn't be unusual to have all if it was a yeah. kind of person who would yeah. have to wear this kind of, mm. so that kind of yeah. style. Yeah. But yes, it is. Yeah. yeah, there's definitely a lot. There's so many pathways that I have yet to sort of look really into that I would like to examine a bit more thoroughly for sure the last one is really bizarre yeah 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 it's, it's a very nice neologist right it's like, like also i know uh, some high, high school school girls they call each other s that means you have a special relationship with them. right yeah it's interesting I remember you uh, avec you, you know, you could you could say avec you means from the French with and it means your partner. So it's kind of it's quite old fashioned now, sort of maybe popular in the in, in, in the sixties and seventies. Right, uh, Hatsi Sensei, and then we come back here. Yes. Thank you. And um, firstly, I'd like to comment on it because I think I'm by myself. I will to the girls' school, so I really know that word is you know, using the onetsu. I definitely use the onetsu for oh. someone who you know I adore. You know, it, like a senpai, I mean senior girl. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's really familiar. Uh, even though I was born in nineteen seventy, so that that means when I was in high school, it was eighties. But still, I think we use the uh, onetsu or high color. So I think it's quite. How can I say long history? So yeah. I was really amazed that then in 1910, in 1910, right? 
I mean, yeah. that kind of words that were used by the Lesbian Legacy like, Translator or something. So I was so amazed at it. So I think I just will do a comment there. But um, in another one, there's a question. So I think I'm, I think I'm around about 1910. But also, I think I'm many more women getting at work. Mm -hmm. And I think I kind of modern girls appear to the society and they always got a short hair with some like a you know cat or something. Yeah. So is there any relation? I mean correlation there between the um Kiraskalajan movement and the modern girls, you know, um movement. I don't know how this is more yeah. 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 yeah, I mean I'm just gonna get the picture of yeah, um, these pictures here, because that has more of that. Um, in some other pictures of uh, Yoshio Nobuko, she has that like, oh, I think it was actually the first, this one with the with the hat, yeah. Um, and obviously she was writing uh, for Sato. So I think there definitely is that overlap between the 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 modern girls sort of look and lifestyle. Um, and the work that was coming out of Sato definitely is. I think it's interesting that there was, because also in, in sort of the first picture, this is a group of some of the, the members and there isn't, that style isn't represented there, but clearly there were people who were wearing those kinds of things who were part of it. So I do think it's really interesting that there's that um, variation, I suppose, in the the styles that were represented in the members of the magazine and the the modern liberated lifestyle of these women could take many different forms that some people would interpret it as wearing the having the short haircuts wearing the hats wearing this like modernist style and for some people it was wearing uh, more traditional Japanese like masculine garments or just traditional Japanese feminine garments or whichever um, while while promoting the same kind of ideals that that could take these different forms um, so yeah there is kind of a the, the crossover there but it's yeah it's interesting to to think about the variation definitely but thank you thank really you. good question <laughs> really interesting yes yeah and then that but okay. thank you very much oh. i was wondering how you view the term beauty relation between like the bossy and the uh, lesbian and the i don't know i other name especially which is recent to appear in the recent recent reporter like you do how do you view the difference between those terms? Because uh, but you can correct me I don't really use the uh, Japanese side of the bridge. I was wondering if it's a Yeah, I mean, I... Um... I, I wouldn't be able to say, like, my speciality obviously isn't l language, um, as you will have noticed from stumbling over various words. Um, but I think that there's... As with, as in like English terminology, there's very, there can be like slight differences between this, this term means one thing and this means another, but also sometimes they can be used for the same thing. And um, yeah, especially I think during this period that I've been talking about today, it is during that time in the early 20th century when all of these new ideas were being talked about in terms of sexuality and sexology where uh, some terms were kind of new and the meanings weren't actually solid so I think that there's like I wouldn't be able to explain really I think the differences between them but sorry have I not like fully addressed <laughs> Um, honestly, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't say like certifiably, um, but if anyone, yeah, if anyone else did have more of a, an explanation and wants to jump in, I wouldn't say no to it, but yeah. But, 
Noticed that a lot of women were using the, you know, sort of leftist reader section, and a lot of them were expressing a, a relationship with the things that were being discussed there. So we eventually created a sort of little specialty page for the women that was called Unizoku or like Lily Tribe, and then it seemed to have basically gone from there. Mm. Now that you, now that you, thank you so much. Um, and now that you say that, it recalls to me that in some of um, Yoshi and Nobuko's work, uh, it was called Flower Tales, I think. And each story was named after a different kind of flower. And one of them was like a lily, so Yuri. Um, and that could be another sort of beginning of, of, of the term. Um, but I don't think that it like, took off from that specific instance but yeah thank you so much for the addition uh, do you want to come you know that all right <laughs> okay thank you very much i mean those are interesting because it was supposed to translate homosexuality but it has the i rather than the sex in it so it actually means same sex love rather than same sex same sex sexuality which is very interesting because as it, it sort of, it arrives as a translated term, but it, it opens a kind of different possibility to think about these relationships that points away from the sort of sexology of the time, as you said, you know, German and uh, mostly Germans and Hungarian origins there. Um, so yes, I think that following the terms itself is, is very important. Um, thank you, yes, uh, please. Yeah, um, I apologize if I'm going to simplify it, that's what the did. <laughs> Um, I'm just wondering if there's like a transnational link of sorts between like um, with like saloon saloon culture, saloon hospitality, uh, culture, yeah. mm. um, between like Japan, Paris, Paris, sort of Paris, and the Macau, and like, is there any sort of linkages there, or is it sort of like separate developments? I um, I'm not sure if there's like specific links between these ones that were being you know set up during the same period but i think they come from like similar roots such as like sato is named after the blue stocking society which is a early literary society kind of an early uh feminist salon culture i suppose and i think that that's um something that a lot of different literary like salon uh, community cultures uh continued from the, those like earlier examples. Um, and I think that it speaks to a, a desire among people and especially like women and especially like queer women to create a space where their creations and their ideas can have a home and be at the forefront. Um, that is a desire that is almost universal that persists like again and again. So I'm not, I think that there probably were some like inspirations that were happening. Like someone would go, oh, that person's doing something over there that I've heard about and that sounds great. Let's let's do a similar thing. But yeah, I think they also just kind of stem from the same wants within people. Um, but yeah, I don't have like a, yes, this person did, you know, like a specific thing, but yeah, it's a, again, a really interesting one to think about. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. This, uh, yes, um, please. Let me just check online. But... I just remember that in Mexico was a similar. When I saw these pictures, I remember these uh, women, the new women in Mexico, that they were upper class and where the connection with the French culture was very, very, you know, very unique and as mm. well, we can recognize in the in the fashion and in the new ideas of queer women. That's very similar, the, you know, the, the hats, 
uh, putting the hair and but in Mexico in Latin America was just for upper class. And this is very interesting because when Frida Kahlo and all the friends that is basically queer people <laughs> introduce another ideas to be a queer or lesbian women, the, the fashion and ideas about to be a lesbian person and be a good person as well change a little bit because they say this is this French fashion style is not more for us. No? Mm -hmm. But it's very interesting making the future thinking about these linkings about how maybe the British and the French fashion evolve around the world, different identities and different yeah. impacts. Yeah, definitely. And also the as you said, the, the class implications of that and who gets to participate in those styles and those communities and those salons and all of those things. There's a lot of, um, there are often these hierarchies between like what's valued and who gets those spaces. Yeah. My lesbian feminist friends, and then we all are thinking the connections between like feminist items, also like women's school, and these women's school always like connected to like some Western culture and Christian at the time. Yeah, so I think yeah, yeah. So so like I was wondering like if there's if you know anything about this connection because you mentioned that some people are like auditioning wearing Japanese like clothes like. Um, uh, what's that? Uh, Mono, Mono. <laughs> yeah. So, but also, like, I, I'm sure there's a definitely connection with like, this Western country to like Western ideal of feminism, with the like, upper class, and then who's like actively introducing the action. Do so, like, you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I think that it's, um, Again, it it says a lot about who is able to access specific ideas um, and specific styles, definitely. Um, yeah, and especially when you you mention things like the girls' schools being like Catholic schools and and stuff like that, it's uh, there are they are often in these like specific locations and settings that have that have once again, those hierarchies and like sometimes the power imbalances with like who, who is shaping the spaces and who's benefiting from it. Um, I'm not sure if I have like any, again, any kind of specific examples or any more to, to add to it, but it's all like very, there's a lot of linking between different cultures that are going on as we've been mentioning in so many different context um at this time which i think is just like fascinating and a thread that should be followed more i don't know if that made any sense whatsoever <laughs> but hopefully a little bit thank um, you yes yeah. okay yes oh, sorry, thank you so much i i just wonder do you know where you get their garments from like are they mass produced or are they like do you uh, customize or do you self-made and how how that garment to fit to their body and make them like nice. they think about their body in terms of uh, gender or lesbian. Yeah, in these like specific examples I've been talking about, I don't, I at least haven't come across the evidence of like where specifically they came from. I think that some of these, you know, again, some of the women were they had more money. Uh, Yoshi, Yoshi and Nobuko, who I mentioned at one point, was one of the richest people in Japan. I'm sure that she was having her clothes made for her at that point, um, or was get, getting like the highest quality um, garments. Whereas in some other instances, maybe not in these specific people I've been talking about, I'm sure it would have, if it was more like masculine clothes were being worn, it might even have been a case of, oh, I bro borrowed it from my brother or something like that. Um, again, yeah, I don't have the um, I don't know where each of these particular people got their clothes from, but I think that there is that, like, the variation of what's worn, what's borrowed, what's been made. Um, 
exists within the the community there but yeah another another great question thank you It'd be interesting to follow up yeah. room for one more oh are we done or i think yes well if not uh thank you very much for coming Big yes thank you. thank you thank you so much for your questions um just a quick announcement. So our next event, or rather uh, important date in the SOAS calendar, next week is Reading Week. But in the Reading Week, we have the 33rd Sir Peter Parker Awards for Spoken Business Japanese on Tuesday afternoon. So if you are around, if you're interested in Japanese language, if you, it's a fantastic opportunity to hear other people uh, speak. Uh, and it's sort of, it is quite a lot of tension that builds over the day and the prize award ceremony at the very end. Our next talk will be after reading week on the 13th of November, and it's entitled From Japanology to Global Japanese Studies, Studies, Evolution and Challenges. Yes, all right. <laughs> You're free to run. Thank you. Thank you. Good.